That's a promise. That's a promise. You know, we live in a world where so many promises are made. And we have so many words now that don't call an unkept promise a lie. We just have terminology because, quite frankly, we've gotten used to not people just not keeping their promises. But that's not your God. He's the original promise keeper. And when he promises that he loves you, he will love you no matter what, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're afraid of, no matter what you regret, no matter what, because he's just that good. Thanks for reminding us that in worship to me. It is so good. So uh, I haven't been up here for a while. I am so pumped tonight to be up here sharing a word that I know is going to benefit us all. But you know, it has been so good the last few weeks to come in, hang out with y'all, walk you into the room uh, in the rain in an umbrella. How cool is that, huh? Yeah, that's concierge pastor service. <laughs> it's just something new we've come up with here at City Church. Uh, and uh, to worship. And then to hear some great words. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Lisa shared a great word. And then last week, Pastor Caleb shared another great word. But I want to go back a couple weeks. Lisa gave the best advice you're ever going to get, no matter what you face in life, if you want a better life. Get God, get tools, get help, and get connected. Now, she talked about it in the context of, of marriage and family. And you're not alone in raising your family. You're not alone in marriage. You're not alone in picking up the pieces. God will, he has, for since the beginning of time, helped human beings when they needed it most, and that's the place to start. Get tools. A lot of people make the same mistakes because they keep using the same hammer for the same problem. We all need tools. Get help. The Bible is very clear. There is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Now, there's some counselors you want to avoid at all costs. <laughs> They're just as jacked up as we are. <laughs> but help makes a difference in your life. And then finally get connected. We're not meant to do this alone. Caleb talked about one of the great things that unleashes hope into the church is, is loving each other and forgiving each other. We need forgiveness and we need to forgive. If you've been around long enough, like a week on the planet, somebody's hurt you. <laughs> and if you've been in the church world long enough, somebody's hurt you and you've hurt somebody yourself. Lots of times people talk about how the church hurt them. But you know what? I find when I look in the mirror, I see things a little differently. So the church is made up of broken, fallible, messed up people. That's just how it is. But since we need forgiveness, wouldn't it be wise to give forgiveness? My mentor and pastor, Joe Whitworth, always says, if you ever find the perfect church, don't go there. You'll mess it up. I'm sure he wasn't just talking to me, but yeah. So the church is made up of human beings. But can I just, before we go into tonight's message, can I just brag in the Holy Spirit on, on this, this church right here? Yeah, we got our issues. We make mistakes. It gets messy around here sometimes. But you all welcome people just as they are. You remember that's how Jesus welcomed you. You love them and you invite them into community. And you're willing, patiently, to walk through the process with them. No matter what it takes, as long as they're willing to walk with Jesus, you'll walk with them. And most weeks, somebody gives their heart to Jesus here. Now, not everybody sticks around, but some of you, that's your story. And you're growing right here. And that doesn't happen in every church. I'm sad to say. But it happens here. Loved ones, that is hope that we can build on. Church, we can build on that hope. Yeah. Well, tonight we're going to talk about something uh, a bit different, uh, but it is something that is so important to not just getting hope and maintaining hope, but growing in our hope. We can't ignore it. Tonight we're going to talk about playing great D. Playing great defense protects our hope. You know, people should protect their valuables. You know, like that Seahawks paraphernalia you put in a drawer? You're going to need that next Super Bowl. Take care of that. It's valuable. But there's things much more valuable. You know, if you're married, your spouse, 
he or she is valuable. Protect their heart. Your kids. Your pets. Some people protect their pets better than the people in their life. But hope is one of the three things that will last forever. It's worth protecting. It's that valuable. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's pray. You are good, God. And your love endures forever. Thanks so much for that. Lord, tonight, if you would bless us and honor us with your presence as you already have, but increasing now, even now, as we go to the word of God, Lord, you're here, God. Lord, we covet your instruction. We covet your direction. We, we covet your encouragement, God, and that you would build hope in us, God, as we look at ways to protect that which is most valuable. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. That was so good. All right, so when I started this uh, hope journey, more accurately, when uh, God got me, you know, focusing on hope, I, uh, I was pretty down. I was pretty down. And if you've been coming to City Church, maybe for the last six months, you've heard in different messages, you know, some of the things that were going on in my life. We're pretty transparent here, and I'm mostly an open book. If you haven't and you want to know the grim details, the particulars, you can go back to the interweb and listen to some of those messages. But I'm not going to talk about that. It was depressing when I was going through it, and I don't want to bring it up again. How's that? But just suffice it to say that uh, for me, hope was a lifeline. But now, honestly, I see it as a launching pad. So much has changed. I'm not any younger. I'm not smarter, faster, or prettier. I may seem that way, but I'm just simply more hopeful, and that's a gift. But you know what? Like any treasure, if we don't protect it, if we don't protect our hope, if we don't guard it, it can be taken away from us. And uh, that's why we play great defense. Defense is so important in protecting our hope. Now, tonight it's going to come at you pretty fast, so I want you to have your pen ready. Because there's going to be at least two or three things that you need to take away. You're going to get some tools tonight. And uh, there may be more, but I'll guarantee you there's two or three. Uh, because I've been with this material all week, and I've got about five or six. <laughs> and uh, I just, I don't want you to miss it. All right? First, we're going to talk about some hope killers that we need to defend against. And then we're going to talk about some hope-building strategies in difficult situations. All right? So the number one hope killer of all time, number one, is sin. It's sin. It's what got the whole, the whole thing screwed up in the first place. A great quote from the book says it so well. It says this, sin fascinates and then assassinates. Isn't that good? Sin fascinates and then it assassinates. Think about the person who goes from dabbling a little bit to becoming an addict. You know, when you run into a 50-year-old junkie, you don't know what it was like for the 16-year-old kid that was just chipping away a little dope and has lost 35 years of his life chasing the dope bag, right? And that, 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 there's lots of things people are addicted to. It's just, it's just horrible. They were playing around a little bit, and now their whole life, everything has changed. Sin can suck us in, and before we know it, our entire life is a mess. It's like technically we're alive, but we're really not living at all. And I think people often are tyrannized by a sin that they don't even think about. The sin of control, the desire to be God, the desire to, to, to get the outcome and not trust God. Now, Lisa and I have mentored many, many married couples, not because we're the, the, the experts, but we've worked through a few things in our time, and we have a really good marriage. We're very blessed in that. And we've taken literally now thousands of people through marriage training. And I'm not picking on any one sex, but ladies... This one is the one that you have to watch for. Because the truth is, is that more often than not, when there was a problem and control came up, it wasn't the guy. He had other issues, but it was a lady. And so I, I don't want you to be that woman. I want you to be a woman that grows in trust and belief that God has better things. <laughs> not that your husband has everything together, because I guarantee you that ain't going to happen. Solomon put it this way. He said, a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. You do not want to be that girl, girlfriend. Now, men, on the other hand, 
Men have a tend women have a tendency to want to be God, but men, on the other hand, want to create another God. We're typically idol worshipers. So men will go to idolatry. Is a woman, as in the original sin, went towards trying to be God, the men go to idolatry. And guys, that just don't work. Think about addiction to pornography, something that I have struggled with my entire Christian life. That is idolatry. Money, stuff. How many people, how many people do you know, you know he just went to work, he was a little down, he kind of saw a new employee or he started flirting around. The next thing you know, he's got a relationship that he's not supposed to have. And his wife, who is stuck with him through thick and thin, you know, hey, she's carrying a few pounds because she had three of your kids, dude. And before he knows it, he's out of the house. He's lost the wife of his youth and his children because he chose another idol. We just can't go there, you guys. It's, it's the kind of thing that fascinates, but then it assassinates hope in our world. Uh, affairs and addictions. Sometimes people get so far down the road in sin, they end up finishing the devil's work, they just take their own lives. That's not what God has for us. You know, Ray Johnson, the author of uh, Hope Potion, he, uh, here's the book, it's a great book. He uh, tells a great story as a young Christian. So he's, he's getting to know Jesus, and uh, he decides to read uh, another amazing book. The Bible. Wow. <laughs> this is such a good book. He thought that was a good idea, and I do too. So if you're a young Christian, just get in the habit of reading the Bible. And if you're an old Christian, you've gotten out of the habit of reading the Bible. It's going to be harder for you. Old dogs, new tricks. But the Word of God will change your life. You know, the book that we're teaching on is based on the book that I, I, I depend on. The Word of God will change your life. All right? So Ray had uh, this idea. He said, well, it's a good idea to read the Bible. So he gets through the Bible, gets to a the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Now, some of you are familiar with it. It's a great chapter. It's a famous chapter. It's referred to as the Hall of Faith. And so Hebrews is all about these women and men who walked with God through difficult circumstances, through faith, overcame all these amazing things. It's an amazing chapter. All right? It's kind of like a Hall of Fame of, of the people that have went before us. And so then he gets to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and he's thinking, okay, what's next? And so Hebrews chapter 12, 1 starts like this. Therefore, since we were surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, and Ray stops and he thinks, what's going to be next? I mean, after, after I read about all these great people, don't look at the, don't look at the board. I, I, got, I got something for you here. Look at me. Look at me. Yeah, okay. All right. He says, so what's coming next? Should we give more? Should we serve more? Do I need to go to Africa? And here's what it says. This is how important it is. It says, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses and to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. That's how important having defense against sin is. Now, we have to play good defense against sin if we're going to be successful in walking out the life of faith to the level that God has for us. But sometimes you're going to have to go to lengths that Honestly, you don't want to go. I don't want to go. Sometimes we have to go to great lengths to battle sin. You know, now sin grows best in the dark and secret places. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, it says, But if we are living in the light, as God is the light, then we'll have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Okay, so while sin grows in the dark, hope grows in the light. The light of God and the light of community. Transparent community that is healthy and safe grows hopeful people who are healthy and safe emotionally. Some people land on verse 9 and, and miss the point of verse 7. They say, okay, I'm just going to confess my sin. God, that's between you and me. We'll just keep it here, right? And it's cool. Now, that's definitely yes on one level. Because God will forgive us, but it's a possible no on another. So follow me here before you make up your mind. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's absolutely a definite yes. As a follower of Jesus, you can have the utmost confidence that Jesus took every sin in your life for all time 
on the cross with him. On the cross, when Jesus said it's finished, when he said it's done, what he meant simply was this. I have done everything the Father has required to restore the relationship between broken human beings and a perfect God. I've taken every sin. I've taken it all on me. The Bible says that the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. What that means was Jesus got beat down for the no good that we were up to. He took care of it. It's done. But I can think in my life of sin that I confess to God, was forgiven of, but went back to over and over and over. Was I forgiven every time? Yes. Did God give me a clean slate every time? Yes. Did I go back to the sin? Yes. Only by bringing that sin to the light of loving, safe community, who I trusted to keep confidence, and I allowed them to challenge me and, and help me, did I get better? Did that pattern begin to change? And if I ever slip back, that's always a possibility, not something I want, but if I ever slip back into that sin, I know I don't have to hide from God. I can confess it to God and to my close community, to the people that walk with me. A wonderful promise about this process from God is found in James. It says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Get yourself a team. That is such a cool promise and a process in overcoming habitual sin. Sin that just keeps coming up and up and up and up and protecting and growing hope in your life. Remember what verse 7 says, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, community. It makes a huge difference. Now here's some other hope killers to watch out for and defend against. Okay, number two, write this down, bitterness and resentment. Those are two ugly brothers. How many bitter people do you know that live better? Like none. I can't think of one. I know a billionaire that's bitter. I wouldn't take his life for a billion dollars. <laughs> Bitterness leaves a bad taste in your mouth and food, and it leaves a bad taste in your life. And resentment, oh gosh, right? Does resenting a person, their position, you know, maybe they got the job and you didn't, their popularity, or she's so pretty, I hate her. He's so pretty, I hate him. I hate everybody. Does that make life better? No. Does being bitter or resentful towards something or someone, something that somebody did to us, does it help us move forward from the wound? Duh, no. But let's be honest here for a minute. How many of you are willing to admit that at some point, maybe it's now, maybe it's some other point in your life, that you were resentful or bitter towards a particular person or a group? Raise your hand. How many of you have struggled with that? All right. Okay. Mine's up. Did you notice mine was up? Yeah. The rest of you that didn't raise your hands, you're either saints, liars, or you're not English speakers. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty common thing to humanity. And uh, just because something, though, is common doesn't mean it's good for us. You know, the common cold, not a fan. This week I thought about a story uh, where God intersected bitterness in my life. I have a, a dear friend. I have two friends named Ron, but it isn't that Ron over there, so don't look at Ron and go, Ron, shh, okay. I've got a dear friend, another dear friend named Ron, and uh, he came to work with me when we were both young guys. Uh, we both had dueling mullets back in the early 90s. I saw the picture the other day. Uh, <laughs> whoever thought that was a good idea. But anyway, uh, he came to work for me, and he was kind of coming out of some stuff in life. And the fact of the matter is... Uh, you know, he worked hard. I loved the guy. I had the privilege to lead him to Christ. But then he got back into dope and sort of disappeared. I'd seen him from time to time. Then one day he shows up on my doorstep and he says, hey, man, I've been clean for a while. I'm looking for work. Well, in the meantime, the work that he had done for me, I had sold that part of my company. And I said, hey, man, the guy that bought that part of the company is floundering. He could use a great form. And you, would, you could really help him out. He's not getting it. So he went to work for the guy for a couple of years, did a great job. And, uh, but one day he shows up. On a Monday, ready for work, and the guy says, we quit, we closed down. Not that they didn't have work. The guy just snapped. 
So Ron comes over to my house and he goes, Mike, John just closed the doors. He's like, I don't have a job anymore. And I go, did he sell the business? I said, no. I said, do you want a business? Thought about it for about a millisecond. He said, he was a good dope dealer. Good dope dealers can run businesses. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, yeah, I do. So we sat down at my kitchen table and uh, I, I helped him write a letter to 150 of his potential customers. I'm kind of good at that. I gave him a little loan and he got a loan from his, uh, his uh, mother and father-in-law and off he went into business and did real well. About three or four years later, though, he decided to be my competitor. See, we did different things. I would, you know, give work to him and, and, and you know, and, and that was hard. But what was worse was he took one of my senior employees and they took a bunch of information from my company and just stamped their name on it and took customers. That hurt. I'm not even going to lie. And I had stung for about four or five months. And it didn't get better with four or five months. It didn't get better with time. So one day I, I pull up to uh, one of my customers, an old guy that just used to call and have a problem with his lawn because he wanted to talk to somebody. Remember Ken Nesbitt? I love that guy. And But God was in the picture. Mr. Nesbitt wasn't home. So as I walk from his front porch along the front yard to see what Mr. Nesbitt's thing was, God talked to me very clearly. He said, Mike, do you want to see Ron fail? And I said, oh. I said, you don't want to see him fail, do you, Lord? And the Lord said very clearly, no. And I said, I don't want to see him fail either. Two days later, there was Ron in his new spray truck, my competitor, in the parking lot of my company as I pulled up in my spray truck. The truck guys, we pull up to each other and roll the windows down. Hey, <laughs> truck guys. <laughs> he said, Ron, what's up, bud? He said, boss. He's called me boss for like 23 years. He said, boss, I'm so sorry. I should have never done this. This wasn't right. Can you forgive me? I never told him what I just told you. Of course, that minute, I, I, God already worked on my heart. What did scare me this week is I thought, what if I would have told God no? Now let me finish the rest of the story. Years later, like a year and a half ago, I bought out Ron's company, and we formed a new company, and he's a minority partner. We work together again. Yeah, we, we have great trust. He's one of my very best friends. He called me right after I worked on this story, right after I'd finished it, Wednesday or Thursday. He says, boss, you got a few minutes? I could tell he was down. He's a pretty positive guy. I said, yeah. And then he told me about an employee that we had to let go because of... Uh, issues concerning our values and, and how we do business and we just had to let the young man go and he said he's going after our customers he's doing this and that and he said like piss can you say that in church <laughs> <laughs> and i stopped for a minute and i said hey buddy let me tell you a story <laughs> And I told him the story that I just told you, and he got very quiet. And he's a man's man. But I could tell he was pretty choked up. And then I told him, I said, uh, hey, man, I said, you know, we had to let this guy go because of character issues. He made us lots of money, and he was very, he had a lot of potential. But if he doesn't get this character thing right, he's going to have a messed up life. I think what we should do is pray for him. So we prayed for the guy. And then I told him, this is, this is a really good parable. This is the best Arabic par parable I know. It's the only one I know, too. But anyway. It goes like this. The big caravan goes through the village, and the little dog's back. But the big caravan keeps going. And I assured Ron, I said, Ron, I've had a little, lot of little dogs barking over the years, but God always takes care of us. Yeah, bitterness and resentment, it's a waste of time. And if you stay stuck, you might miss the miracle. All right. Uh, number three, worry and anxiety. A wonderful woman of God who passed away some years ago, Corey Ten Boom, said this. She says, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Isn't that good? And it's so true. I'm a recovering worrier. I relapse from time to time. But I can say that it doesn't do a bit of good. Last night, I, or last week, I got to practice this one. I actually got to practice almost this whole message last week. A blast. What a fun week that was. 
Yeah. <laughs> I had one of those long nights. I got some bad news that I just didn't expect coming the, the, the afternoon. And, and at night, I, I could barely sleep. And I mean, I know that worry doesn't do any good. So what I had to do is uh, what First Peter 5, 7 says. It says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So all night. God, I just, this is just tearing me up. God, I, I just got to give it to you. I got to give it to you. The New International Version puts it like this. It says, give all your worries and cares to God, or rather cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And you know what casting means? It means throwing. So all night I'm throwing stuff up to God. And sometimes you gotta, you're going to throw your arm out. You're throwing a lot because you take it back. It's a process. But if you'll continue to do that, God will meet you where you're at. See, I realized that the next day, I had a, one of the most important talks I give every year was our company's kickoff. And people from all three of our, our, our different companies that Lisa and I own were going to be there, many new employees. It's a day where we set the pace for the year. We invite people into the vision and values that our companies were founded by. And uh, if I went in there disappointed about something that these people have nothing to do with, how fair would that have been? I knew that wasn't going to work. I had to cast all my cares on God. And I'll talk a little bit later about how that worked because it was actually pretty cool. Can I just tell you something? Your dad has big shoulders. And I'm not talking about your earthly dad unless he's like some power lifter or something. All right? But your heavenly father has big shoulders. When the Bible says that we can call him Abba Papa, that means dad. That means Papa. I mean, I respectfully call my heavenly father my heavenly father, but you need to think of me as your dad. He is your dad, and he's got big shoulders. His old song says he's got the whole world in his hands. Now, if he can carry the whole world in his hands, what can he carry on his shoulders? Right? So put it on your father's shoulders and leave it there. He's so got this. All right, number four, regrets. <laughs> Have any? <laughs> if we spend our life looking back, and regretting, how are we going to grow our hope? How are we going to take a hold of the great life that God has in front of us? Now, I will say this about the past. The past is a good teacher, but it's a lousy camping spot. Learn from the past, definitely. Live in the past, definitely not. In Jeremiah chapter 29, the first half of it, it really is God says to a people who had totally blown it. He says to him, he says, look, stay put. Do what I say. Do what I say right now, and that I'm going to care for you, and then i got a plan and a purpose for you tomorrow. Now, sometimes a scripture, like, and we're not going to pull it up for a second, but sometimes a scripture, like Jeremiah 29, 11, becomes so common that we forget the beauty and the power of the promise. But some years ago, I had the pleasure of looking at that scripture through new eyes. My son-in-law, Bradley, was a young pastor. He was part of our team. He was like all of our team at the time. He was bivocational, so he worked full-time, and then he poured his heart out into this. And like young people and not-so-young people, he made some mistakes along the way. Some of the older people in our church were not as gracious and mature as they could have been, but I didn't allow that to be an excuse for Bradley to own his mistakes. So I said, buddy, you got to fix this. you got to be respectful. you got to follow up. This is important for you. And so he did everything that I asked him to do because I knew God was working in Brad's life and God had great things. And then one day, Brad finds Jeremiah 29, 11. Can we have that scripture, please? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And I remember when my son-in-law got a hold of this in a dark time, he was so excited. He says, Mike, have you ever seen this? Yeah, a couple times. <laughs> it was just so wonderful to see that God had given him hope in a time where it was kind of bleak. This week, I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> you know, that never happens. <laughs> okay, I lied. <laughs> uh, this week, uh, Brad, who is the associate campus pastor at the university campus of Elevation Church, they just opened their new facility that they built. They're going to have three services. There'll be two to 3,000 people there. Elevation just baptized their 10,000th person. 
God is moving, and God is moving powerfully in this young man who got his start in this little church right here. So, pretty good question here. Did God have a hope and a future and a plan for Bradley? And my daughter, Sarah? Yeah. Does he have great plans for you? Plans to give you a hope and a future? Absolutely. With me, we'll go. All right, the last one of these hope killers we're going to talk about. There's others, but, you know, we've only got so much time. We've got to get back to that DVR, right? Those acts. <laughs> past failure. Number five, past failure. And, 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 and I think, if you're honest, you, you got a few, and, and I got a whole bunch. I sold one business, and I unwound another. I sold the business in 1995. Um, it was, at the time, our core business, and it was the one that we did the most of. But in 2004, I realized 1995, something had to change. I had to focus on something else. But in 2004, I actually started a business, and within 13 minutes, I started it and stopped it. I unwound it. Both were financial successes. But one wasn't right anymore, the one that I sold in 95, and the other wasn't right at the time, the one that I started and stopped in 04. But in 2014, with my buddy Ron, I started a business that included what both of those businesses did. We took all that together, and it's amazingly successful. It's, it's doing really well. It did well financially, but even more so relationally, structurally. The energy in that business, the, 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 the trueness to our values, as a, as a company, it's just phenomenal. So what changed? What's the difference now? My past failures taught me. They were brutal. They left marks, but they were also beneficial. Johnny Cash, uh, who battled drug and alcohol addiction for years, puts it like this. You build on failure to step in stone. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> Sorry to do that to you. <laughs> Let's try it again in, 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 in Mike. <laughs> you build on failure. It's a stepping stone. And the greatest basketball coach of all time and leader of leaders, John Wooden, said this. If you are not making mistakes, you're not doing anything. Now, Pastor Mike says the fear of failure can pretty much guarantee the absence of success. Now, I'm no John Wooden or Johnny Cash, but the last part is true. Now, how cool, cool is it, though, to be quoted along with those guys, even if you have to quote yourself? It's kind of like a quote, quote, selfie. Yeah. And it's trending, really. But it's true. Don't let uh, past failures rob you of your future. The Bible says that he's an accuser, and he is. He's going to accuse you all sorts of stuff. So when he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, and then just focus on following Jesus. Now, finally tonight, we're going to look at we're going to finish with three hope-building responses to difficult situations. I so wanted to put my favorite commercial up here, but it was just too late to do this to my to our wonderful team. Uh, but uh, you guys know that Geico commercial where it says, when you're in a horror movie, you make bad choices. Right? I love that commercial. It is the best commercial. And so, okay, so let's set it up, right? You got these four young adults. It's a classic horror thing there. They got the creepy house in the background. And, uh, and they're all like freaked out, the adrenaline's going, and this young woman goes, let's, let's just get in the running car and drive away. And they look at her like, that's the most absurd thing that anybody ever thought of, right? That's a horrible idea. Let's hide behind the wall of chainsaws, right? And I don't know if you catch it, at the very end, they're running again, and they go, let's go hide in the cemetery. Well, Kind of like this. Number one in your outline here. This is these are three great responses. Never make decisions when you're down. Never make decisions when you're down. It's worse than being in a horror movie. I want to read something that Ray Johnson wrote that is so good, and uh, I can't say it any better. So let's let's let Ray tell the story. Again, as a young Christian, he ran into a real rough patch. And by the way, when you give your heart to Jesus, if you're a young Christian, or you know maybe tonight you start to walk in faith. I'm going to guarantee you're going to run into some things. You're going to run into stuff as a Christ follower. That's just how it is. But God is good. He's real good. But you're going to run into some difficulty. And Ray ran into a bunch of them. And so he finally got fed up. And he went to his buddy John's house, threw his Bible down, and said, John, I quit. I'm done with this faith thing. And then John said that here's how it goes. John, 
Ray says, John saved my life with this one line. He looked at me with compassion and said, never make decisions when you're down. Ray, if I made decisions while I was down, I wouldn't be married. If I made decisions when I was down, I wouldn't have kids. If I made decisions when I was down, I would have quit my job. If I made decisions when I was down, I wouldn't have a faith. The single most important thing a human being needs to do is to determine that they, for the rest of their life, will not make any decisions when they're down. And then Ray continues this. This is so good. Let's, let's be honest. Human beings are wired. So the minute we get down, we start making decisions. I quit. I'm leaving. I'm moving. I'm walking up. I'm giving somebody a piece of my mind. Almost all knee-jerk decisions end up being destructive decisions. John's counsel changed my life. The incident took place 35 years ago. But the lesson still keeps me from destroying my hope. Listen real carefully to this. Don't make decisions when you're down. Decisions determine direction, which determines destiny. In other words, the decisions that you make determine the direction that you take. The direction you take determines your destiny. Everything you are, everything you will be is due to the decisions you will make. So don't make decisions when you're down. This week I got to practice it when I got that bad news. It shocked me. It stunned me. And my first reaction was to say, well, I'm not going to. And then I remembered this talk. And I said to the, the people in the room, I said, forget that. I'm not going to do that. Never make decisions when you're down. If you knew that crossing that street tonight, we have crossing guards, you're safe, right? But if you knew crossing that street tonight, that you had a 90% chance of hit, being hit by a bus when you cross the street, no way, not unless you're suicidal or foolish. Nobody would do that. But I'll guarantee that if you make decisions when you're down, you got better than 90% chance of making things worse and making a poor decision. All right, number two, respond to bad news in great ways. Respond to bad news in great ways. How many of you have ever had bad news? Wow, oh, just a few of you. Well, the rest of you, you got some things to not look forward to. <laughs> All right, bad news is part of life. Uh, like that bad news I, I shared. That morning after I had prayed all night to God with about two hours sleep, I realized I needed to be on for a bunch of people in just, just a couple of hours. So I got my Bible out. I got hope portion out because I knew what I'd read, and I read that over. I, I got in the Word of God, and I prayed. And I said, God, I need to be the best I can be for this, and I can't take what I'm experiencing emotionally into that room. So God, being who he is, and because I casted all my cares on him, caused me to write down what I needed to do about that other situation. He gave me a solution. He gave me a direction forward. And I was able to put that away for when it was time to do that. I made a great decision that morning. I won't tell you I always do. But because I did what the Bible said, because I cast my cares on God, because I poured out my heart to God, I was able to go and be successful in what God had for me that day. God wants you to be successful. You matter. You matter. Your world is important. Not just to you, it's important to God. You matter. So learn to respond to bad news in great ways. You'll miss it a few times. But people that respond to bad news in great ways, they have really good lives. <laughs> people that respond to bad news in bad ways, well, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's Bad. It's just bad. Final. Shake it off and step up. You're going to get knocked down. Yesterday was my day off. I spent six or seven hours with Jesus, did a little workout, and then I watched MMA DVR stuff for like three hours. It was great. Some of those guys get the snot knocked out of them, right? And then they come back and win. It is just phenomenal. I would fold like a kite. But I'm not an MMA guy, and neither are you. You don't have to do that, all right? But you're going to get knocked down in life. Shake it off and step up. There's an old, you probably heard this story, but a farmer, his mule fell into a well as it went into a bar one night. No, that's a different story. But anyway, uh, so the mule goes, falls into a well, and, and the farmer thinking, well, the well's ruined because if you've got a dead mule in a well, well and you drink that water, the mule's not going to be the only thing dead, right? 
And so he wants to put the mule out of his misery and, and, and close up the well. So he starts pouring dirt. There's all his buddies, farmer buddies, pour dirt on the, on the mule. And the mule's just freaking out, braying, shaking. Then the mule figures out, if it shakes and steps up, it don't die. Eventually, the mule walks out of the well. And that's how life is. You're going to get knocked down. So you've got to shake it off and you've got to step up. So here's the deal. Your life is meant to be amazing. You may not think that, but I know what God has done for me. And I'm a regular guy. I'm as regular as you can get. Your life is meant to be amazing. You'll have challenges. You'll have disappointments. You'll have victories and you'll have defeats. You'll be tested. But you can pass the test with flying colors. Flying colors. The scripture says it is banner over me. Those flying colors is love. God loves you, and he has a plan and a purpose for you. You're to be a difference maker. You're to be a man or woman of consequence. Lives will change. You will influence people if you make the choice to defend that valuable gift of hope and walk it out. Do you want to be a difference maker? Do you want to pass the test with flying colors? Here's the, here's the gold standard. If you're a Christ follower, you're going to heaven, okay? If you ask Jesus in your heart, well, I understand you're going to heaven. Now, you can enter heaven and smell like smoke. And really, look in the book of Jude. The rest of eternity, it sounds like, hey, Smokey, how you doing? <laughs> Which, it's cool, you're in heaven. But wouldn't you rather hear your dad say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the reward that I have for you, that has been set aside from the foundations of the earth for you. You can pass the test, and hope is a huge part of it. And I hope, first and foremost, it's in Christ. And then, this thought. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege of uh, getting to live it out and seeing just how practical. Uh, this chapter and this uh, this teaching, this wise counsel from Pastor Ray uh, was for me in my own life. And Lord, since I love this church and I love these people, God, and you love them more, Lord, I pray that this word would really sink deep down in people's hearts and build hope that you have better things ahead for us. That is your plan. It's your purpose in life. Father God, no matter what anyone is facing tonight, let them hear the word that they need to hear. Let them apply the word that they need to apply. Let them hold on to that word. And Father, give them the endurance to keep casting cares and keep shaking it off and stepping out. I want everybody to keep your eyes closed, your head bowed, please. You know what? Jesus is just that good. And I want you to know that. And maybe he's speaking to you right now. Maybe you walked away from God. Maybe there's a distance between you and God. You loved him. You still love him, but you're distant. You're not connected. Tonight you can reboot. Or maybe you never have known God, but there's this God that loves us so much, as Pastor Lisa shared, that he, 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 he paid our sin debt in full. And he wants to give you a life full of hope. But Jesus said, my purpose, Jesus said, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And that starts with a relationship with Christ. If you want to start or rekindle your relationship with Christ tonight, just simply raise your hand. Pastor Mike, that's me. That's me. Good, good, excellent, wonderful. That's super. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to ask you to pray a simple prayer with me out loud. But church, we're community, we're family. And so we're going to pray with these precious folks who are starting or restarting their journey, all right? We're going to pray out loud a simple prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Become my God, my Lord, and my companion. Give me the strength, Jesus, to walk with you each day until I walk home with you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. That's, 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 that's good stuff, man. Okay, so if you prayed that prayer and you raised your hand, would you please go to the 5G? We're not going to embarrass you. We just want to give you something, and we want to connect with you. And, uh, you know, there's going to be challenges to this journey of yours. 
and 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 doing it in in, in community will help. We're not going to bug you, but we want to help you. I've really thought about this. Ron over there and a friend of mine, Rowan, if those men wouldn't have been in my life, I wouldn't be here today. We're not meant to do this alone. We do it with Jesus and we do it with our peeps. All right? And you got peeps you don't even know yet. Okay. Uh, and then finally, guys and gals, everybody, play great defense this week. Play great defense. You know what? Hey, offense sells tickets, but defense wins championships and your champions in Jesus' name. Have a great week. I'll see you next week.